Hey, deserving listeners, love is blind. Let's watch. <sighs> Not good. I need answers. Yeah. Why did you accept my proposal? In the pods. I'm glad they're having this conversation. It's probably a breakup conversation, I'm going to assume. So he's saying, I want answers. Why did you accept my proposal? I'm thinking the honest answer from her is in the pods, I fell in love with you, but when I met you, it, I just didn't feel it. Something along those lines. And this is a thing that I often talk about, that when we are dumped, when we're broken up with, a very common narrative, possible narrative that will emerge is, well, they must have never loved me. It's a seemingly natural narrative that will emerge because so many people assume that. You are in love with someone and then they reveal to you that they're not in love with you in that way anymore or something. They might even say, I've been out of love with you for a while. So that can feel very hurtful, right? So wait, so for the past six months, you haven't loved me? And it is tempting to conclude, well, you must not have ever loved me because no one who truly loves me would do this to me. I feel so much pain and so much betrayal. How could you possibly do this? Well, you must have never loved me. And something, sometimes people will even conclude that themselves. They'll say later on after a relationship ends, it's common for people to say, well, I was never really in love. Yeah, yeah, I know that I thought I was in love and I said I was in love with the person and I told everyone I was in love with the person, but I wasn't really in love. You know, this new relationship, I'm definitely really in love. And maybe that's true, but more often than not, what really happened is that we don't feel the love currently, so we assume we must not have ever been in love. We have a really hard time imagining that we were in love. Another factor is if the relationship went really poorly for you, you have reasons in your mind to go into denial of the way you felt about that person, or you just cannot relate to yourself being attracted or being in love with that person. So he is asking question, asking a question right now of why did you choose me in the pods? I think because he is wanting her to say, I was in love with you, I wasn't tricking you, that kind of thing. Now, for some people being dumped, it is an easier narrative to believe that she tricked him. People will do this too. They will conclude, well, it, she was a psychopath, she was never really into me, and it's easier for me to move forward assuming that she's an evil human being. And I don't know, people can decide on the narratives they want. Of course, we can never know the answers and there's a lot of factors. Sometimes people are evil or act in evil ways, purposely harmful Machiavellian ways. But I don't usually recommend that people land on that narrative because there's so many downstream effects that are negative. Like, well, if she is evil, then I have no judge of character. And the next person I fall in love with could be evil, could not be evil. And it could really throw a wrench in your optimism or your hope that things will work out for you and your hope in other human beings. I think it's a much more constructive narrative to accept the possible reality, in, especially if they're, you're being told this, that you were broken up with not because the person was evil and not because the person was against you, but because things happen. People fall out of love sometimes. They fall deeply in love and then for whatever reason, they don't love the person anymore. And I think that's the case for Jackie. I think she felt she fell deeply in love with Marshall and the pods, however you want to define that, you know, they're in the pods and chose him, I think pretty confidently. And then upon meeting him, started to realize that she just wasn't attracted to him. I don't think this has much to do with Josh. I don't, at least I'd like to think that it has less to do with Josh and just more to do with Jackie just isn't attracted to Marshall. So, you know, erase Josh from the picture. I would imagine that Jackie would still say, yeah, I, I think I need, now it, she probably is accelerating the breakup because of Josh but I'm guessing that that's, that's really what happened. I don't know that to be true, obviously, but it seems like that's possible. So, so, so let's see what she says here. I need answers. Yeah. Why did you accept my proposal? In the pods, I, what I felt for you was real. That was so real to me. And that's great. That's right out of my recommendation is if true, and if you care to, well, something you could do to really help someone when you're breaking up with them is to say, it was real. 
all that stuff in the beginning was real. I wasn't lying. I was truly in love with you. I was not lying to you. I wasn't betraying you. I was in love with you, and all that is true. It's helpful because for people in Marshall's position, like I said, one, they will not mistrust their picker in the future, you know, their ability to evaluate potential partners. And they will be able to trust that, well, yeah, I felt it too, you know, because that's, that's that feeling. It's like, I felt like you were in love with me and I felt like I was in love with you. Was it all a lie? Was it all just a farce? And so it's important to reassure someone that they, the things that they felt were true. And so she's being clear, which is a really helpful thing to say usually. It's just the outside world got to us. And got to us or got to you? I'm emotionally drained. Okay, so she says the outside world got to us. I wonder what that means. The outside world got to us. Hmm. More questions. <laughs> I don't know what that means. And we could make some guesses. Is that Josh? Is that work? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What, what would the outside world? Family? Maybe she's referring to that. I don't know. And then he says, got to us or got to you? I think he's saying, look, I was in it. So the outside world, it didn't get to me. It got to you, it sounds like. Now, his demeanor is, uh, you know, hostile or distant, whatever word you want to put to it. And I get it because I think he knows, maybe they had a talk prior to this talk, that they're breaking up, she's breaking up with him. So, you know, he's hurt. And it takes a lot of effort to stay in a conversation like this without yelling and screaming or running away or, you know, breaking down crying. Maybe you don't want to do that. It'd be perfectly fine if he did. So I'm guessing that he's trying to hold it together. But there's also a mode that he's going into. Maybe this is a defensive mode that he is used to where he comes across like it's no big deal or, or I don't know, it's hard to put a finger on what he's trying to communicate. But on the scale of things, he's doing pretty well because he's asking questions and he's not getting defensive or accusatory or anything. Maybe he will. I tried as much as I can to answer your question, but I wasn't sufficing. And I think my fed up moment was coming back home after Chelsea's party, you still was pressing on me. And I'm like, bro, like, I'm just trying to go to bed. I got to go to work. Okay, so earlier with Josh, she said that Marshall is too sensitive. So I think she's referring to that experience where he wants to talk and she doesn't want to talk about it. So hard to know how to evaluate that. But it would make sense that Marshall would want to talk. Now, he doesn't have the entitlement to demand that she talk late at night after a long day when she has to wake up the next day. But to conclude, oh, this is just so annoying. He's just too sensitive. He just wants to talk about our relationship. That is, you know, maybe you could say a style issue of a relationship, maybe a personality clash. But there's a possibility that she is making a, a spurious criticism of him that you know, because the things that we saw were, uh, you know, going to the party, he was saying that they're arriving in separate cars and they're having a lot of fighting. And there was that huge fight about the aggression thing. And that didn't seem to get really resolved. It's, I mean, they talk about it like it wasn't resolved. So he has some things he wants to talk about. He wants to clarify, are we still in a relationship? He sees Josh talking to her. He doesn't know what they talked about because he didn't. He wasn't there. We saw a little bit of it anyway in an edit, edited version. So it makes sense that he would want to clarify, are we in a relationship? Are, are we together? What's happening? It would make sense that he would want to know that. So for her to just say, you're too sensitive, I don't know. Now, again, she doesn't have to talk about it that at that point. She could wait until the next day. But at least the way they edited it, the next day she met up with Josh. Who knows if it was the next day. But on the other hand, is it somewhat valid? Could we see ourselves, if we were in her shoes, feeling like this statement is valid towards him? of you're always wanting to talk about everything. You, you're, you're so sensitive to signals of rejection or to difficulties between us. I just want to sometimes take a break from talking about our relationship. So might we feel that that is justified? I don't know. After Chelsea's party, you still was pressing on me. 
And I'm like, bro, like, I'm just trying to go to bed. I gotta go to work tomorrow. I get that you need your feelings validated. I get that. But when I say, look, I'm just trying to go to bed. We can talk about this tomorrow. There's, we can talk about that tomorrow. I can't give you. Now, I will say it doesn't take long to validate someone's feelings. People will talk about it like it takes forever. And you can literally potentially validate someone's feelings in under three seconds. <laughs> you just be like, hey, I'm here to tell you, I love you and I totally understand you. Let's hug and can we talk about it tomorrow? But I think what was happening was she was highly ambivalent about wanting to be with Marshall. And so that night after Chelsea's party, she didn't want to talk about it because she didn't want to get into it because she would either have to lie or open up a can of worms that she didn't want to get into. And so I, I think, I don't know, it's just me assuming things and I, I'm just speculating, of course, but I think that that's what was really happening. So for her to say, the fact that you were asking me those questions was a result of being too sensitive and I just want to move on. I mean, what if he did that? What if he came home from the party and didn't bring it up and just went to bed? The two of them would have been better off because of that? <laughs> I don't think so. You what you want. Meaning that if he didn't bring it up and never brought it up again, would they be in a good place right now? I don't think so. I think that it had to be brought up at some point, like how are your feelings or where are we right now or how can we work on a relationship? That conversation in all likelihood had to happen regardless of someone's style of a relationship. So she seems to be implying that, look, these outside forces are at play and you kept pestering me about wanting to talk about your feelings. And that's not the way I would phrase it. He he would often want to help her with her feelings. That was often the situation. So now I will say that on average, when people are breaking up, it, it takes a lot of self-awareness to be able to identify a coherent argument as to why you broke up. The other thing that she might be actually avoiding is just saying, I'm just not sexually attracted to you, and I find I'm very sexually attracted to Josh. That might be the big neon sign in her mind. But she wants to save him from that kind of pain. And there are different philosophies of this, but I think sometimes it's worth considering, right? If you know, you're in her shoes and you're just like, well, if I told him the truth, I think it would really hurt his feelings and give him a complex about things. And I don't want to do that. So I'll, I'll identify, I won't lie, but I'll identify these other reasons that I believe will be less likely to create a complex in him of, of shame or self-hatred or something, or he's sensitive about this and that. So I'll, I'll say these other reasons, you know. But as I've said before, even in this series, I wish people would just start off with the topic sentence of, I don't know why I don't want to be in a relationship with you anymore, but I just know that I don't. I, I don't have motivation to work on the relationship. I'm, I'm feeling that. When I think about not being with you, when I think about us breaking up, it actually feels kind of like a release. It feels like it would be better for me. I'm not saying that you're a burden on me or there's something wrong with you. I'm just saying that my heart's not in the relationship anymore. I don't know what that means. It was originally, but just something about the way we come together, or maybe it's the conflicts we've had. And, you know, I'm, I'm to blame for those conflicts too, but I don't know. I, I've really tried to get that love and feeling back again, and I, I just don't feel it, and I, I'm just sorry. I wish people would just start with something like that, because I think most of the time, that is th the topic sentence. Now, you can get into some nitty-gritty. It's like, well, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. Because the thing she's pointing out, even for her, might be a plus in, in some time. I think it was a plus for her at one point. So I wish people would just say that and just stand on that. It's pretty ambiguous, though. It's like, well, and people in, in Marshall's shoes will often, well, why did you fall out of love me? What happened? Because I feel like there's this notion in society and maybe rom-coms that there are these very discrete, concrete reasons as to why we fall in love or not in love. And there just isn't any science to back that up. We do not know why we do anything, let alone fall in love. <laughs> so I wish people could just accept that, you know, sometimes you just fall out of love. And you can maybe make a story as to why that happened, but it's uncertain. I have never asked anything of you. Never. You need a lot of security. So now they're, I think, starting to argue. And he's saying, I've never asked anything of you. So I think he's trying to make a case that, look, your accusation of me is that I'm sensitive and I'm demanding, but I've never asked anything of you. And yeah, I think they've both 
they both have asked things of each other, whether it was explicit or otherwise. So I think he's either distorted or being defensive or something. You know, he could certainly say, I don't think I was being sensitive and I don't think I was pestering you. I think I had reasons to want to know. Yeah, maybe I was a little pressuring that one night, but I think the the conversation was warranted. You're acting like I was bringing up things that were irrelevant. I, I, you know, the question mark as to our relationship was, I think, a, a good question. So, you know, I think you could say something like that, but to say something I've never asked anything of you, my dogs are barking. I don't know if you can. <laughs> Literally, I think a car just drove by <laughs> and they think that the world is coming to an end. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you want a good guard dog to let you know if there's any. Yeah, I, I've received some interesting emails from people who want to get me on the internet. So sometimes it's nice to have a <laughs> dog anyway. So the other thing here is there's this speculation of codependency and, and overfunctioning from him. And one of the qualities of that usually is a denial of one's needs and feelings and uh, focus on people outside of the individual uh, because of the way they're treated or their role in the family, parentification, that sort of thing. It can feel wrong when someone says, hey, you have a lot of needs. And when I try to attend to your needs, it just feels overwhelming to me. That's kind of what she's saying. And for the codependent overfunctioner, they're, they're like, what are you talking about? I don't have any needs. I'm perfect. I'm fine. I, 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 w- I was the stable one. You were the one who had all the needs. That's often the overfunctioner's assumption or their foundation for a everything. It's like, no, I'm good. Every, I'm, I'm okay. But my partner, boy, I really have to take care of her. So I think he might be speaking from that, but I don't know. He's not really saying much. He's not giving much detail. I say, look, I'm just trying to go to bed. We can talk about this tomorrow. There's, We can talk about that tomorrow. I can't give you what you want. I have never asked anything of you. Oh, upon rewatching it, I think there's another possibility because she's kind of saying, I don't know if she means it to be this way, that, look, I'm breaking up with you because you ask for so much and I can't give you all the things that you want. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, I've never had a complaint about you in that way. It, it's also possible that she's saying that because she's like, look, I'm not in love with you and you deserve to have someone that loves you. And so I can't give you that. I don't know. I, I don't know what she, there's another possibility that she's just randomly saying phrases. Sometimes people will do that when they're breaking up with someone because they just don't know how to put it into words. It, actually, I don't know if I've ever talked about this before. So when people are breaking up with people and maybe you were recently or are going to be in a situation like this, there's this, and this, I guess, applies to any conversation in which you're disappointing someone, letting them down, like quitting a job or telling someone that you can't go on vacation with them or something. There's this fantasy that you will tell the person, look, I want to break up with you and I'm going to lay out the reasons why. There's this fantasy in the person doing the disappointing that the person being disappointed will go, oh, okay, you know what? I totally see that. You're totally justified and valid for breaking up with me or for whatever. And I find that because of that fantasy, there's this tendency to get upset or to feel like, okay, how do I work this? What what can I say to get this person to agree with me and say, like, you're right. You have to head into a conversation like this just knowing that the person that you're going to disappoint is going to get triggered. They're going to get distressed. They're going to get upset. They might get angry. You don't deserve to be abused, of course, but, you know, they're going to get upset. They're going to be hurt. They're, this might be one of the biggest hurts that Marshall is going to go through. And it's filmed. It's, you know, it's pretty awful. So, you just have to accept that there's a possibility that this is going to go very badly for the two of you. And this is why you have multiple conversations if the person in Marshall's shoes is up for it. Because, you know, this could go very badly, but you continue to talk afterwards and to process and understand each other and apologize. And then eventually Marshall might say something like, you know what, I, I guess I see it now. It, it sucks, but I, I get it. Never. You need a lot of security. I have done nothing but right by you. And for you to sit here and say that I require a lot, I'm emotional, yes. Right, so that's what he's saying. It's like, so you're saying I'm demanding? That's why you're leaving me? I'm too demanding? Uh, But of course, they were both demanding of each other. But he will frame it, I'm guessing, as I didn't ask you to do anything. 
which of course I think he did. So whether it's explicit or not, and she's saying, what did she say? Asked anything of you. Never. You need a lot of security. Right, you need a lot of security. Uh, it's hard to know the ins and outs of their relationship, and of course, I don't know what's in their heart, but everyone needs a lot of security. <laughs> And I think this is at least in the direction of her agreeing with the toxic masculine ideal that real men don't care. <laughs> Just imagine that, that like the ideal man doesn't have emotions, doesn't have, doesn't have need for attachment security, doesn't have feelings, doesn't recognize their feelings, has destructive ways of trying to do, I don't know. So I don't know what she's saying. It's possible that he, he was very insecure. I mean, you could certainly point towards some things that might indicate that. Hard to know. Uh, it's also hard to know how much Jackie was invested in this relationship to begin with when I think about it. The way that she approached, yeah, I mean, when I think back on it in the pods, they were dating and they seemed to be hitting it off, but God knows what that means. And then at some point, Jackie tells him, Marshall, that she was seriously entertaining a relationship with someone else, Josh, right? And then he gets upset and she decompensates. She cries a lot. And it's possible that she just on a whim uh, made a decision to go like, well, I guess I'll go with Marshall because it maybe that seems like the best bet or it feels like the safest bet or something. And hadn't really thought about things. I don't know. That, that seems like quite an accusation because you could certainly say that about everyone on the show. Uh, yeah, I, I think the most likely narrative, if I were in her shoes, is that she fell in love in the pods and then she just didn't feel chemistry afterwards. So I don't know why they don't say that. I think maybe because they don't want to admit that love isn't always blind. All right, well, I want to thank you for liking this video if you did, or subscribing to the YouTube channel, or hitting the bell, I believe. You know, sometimes I hit the bell with other YouTube channels and nothing happens. Does that mean you get an email or something? I don't know. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that'd be an easy question for me to answer if I just Googled it. Anyway, but I thank you for liking any of the videos. Uh, many of you do, and it's I don't know. It just is a little bit of, of a self-affirmation. The, the way that I think about it is that as a professor, when I would teach, students would occasionally nod their head in class or smile at me or talk with me or, I don't know, have eye contact with me. We would have, we would have a back and forth. I would have eye contact. I would nod with, you know, there's a, the classes at my university. There's a lot of participation and discussion. And so there's an indication that I am coming across as at least a passable professor, if not an appreciated professor. And when I'm doing this kind of stuff, I kind of think of the thumbs up as that, where it's just a little nod of the head, like, okay, you know, I hear that. <laughs> Occasionally, uh, you know, a particularly nice student after class would just come up and say, hey, you know, you, you really nailed it today or <laughs> something. And I'd be like, oh, wow. Because, you know, it's, that's why I'm here is to be helpful and... Anyway, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.